Stop and hit restart. We're good. Okay. John 6, verses 15 through 25. Uh, Jesus, what we've seen in the Gospel of John is that Jesus is, and again, I know I sound a little bit like a broken record here, but it's, it's a point that is made in almost every message, really, at some level. And it's a point that's clear in the entire Gospel of John, that Jesus is the creator and sustainer of the universe, the creator and sustainer of all life. And he enters into human flesh to seek and to save that which was lost, to die on the cross, to pay the penalty for the sins of the world. And that's pretty cool when you think about it, because Jesus came to die for you. And we could think about Jesus came to die for the sins of the world, and that's kind of like a lofty theological point. But the fact that he came to die for me, that's pretty cool. I'm not deserving of that. Are you deserving of that? You know, you know you. And no one really knows you better than you. You know you. And you know, if you're being honest with yourself, that you are not worthy of Jesus' death. That's for sure. Uh, but Jesus came to die for you, to pay the penalty for your sins. Right? And he's, 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 he's already, his, his glory is declared in chapter 1. And he's already starting to declare, to display that glory as we go through the Gospel of John. The crazy thing about it, as we read through this gospel and as we study through this gospel, is that the people who are the most religious people, the people that you would expect to be on his side are the people that are against them. So if you're a Jew in the first century and you're thinking about the Pharisees, they're the party of the people, and you're thinking about the Sadducees, and there's a lot of respect for these guys, and it would be wild to think that the religious leaders, the religious examples of your nation are against God. But all the while, they look like they're for him. They're against Jesus. And so Jesus has had to kind of deal with these opponents uh, on and off throughout the Gospel of John. And it's going to get worse. It's going to get a lot worse, obviously. Last week, Jesus continued to display his glory in spite of all the opposition that has come against him and that will continue to come against him, he's displayed his glory in the feeding of the 5,000, one of the most popular, one of the most well-known miracles, the only miracle that all four Gospels really mention. An awesome miracle where Jesus clearly displayed who he was. When the people see it, when the people see Jesus perform this miracle, they want to crown him king right then and there, but that can't happen because Jesus knows their hearts. Uh, look at John 6 and verse 15. So Jesus, this is really kind of an extension of last week. It, it's, it's almost like verse, verse 16 belongs with last week with the feeding of the 5,000, but it really also belongs with this week because it kind of sets the stage for what's going on this week. So Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. And so uh, they want to make him king. According to Matthew, uh, immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the crowds away. And he sent those crowds away, really, because they want to make him king. He needs to get away, to get alone, and pray. By the way, I can, I can resonate with that. You know, uh, we have a festival in our town every year. And we were doing baseball the other night, uh, I think Friday night. And I said, let's drive up and see what's going on at the festival. And, oh, man, they were just like shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder people. And there was loud music. And I was like, no, thanks. Thanks, but no thanks. You know, I'm not interested in large crowds. I just don't, you know, I used to. I used to like it, but I just, I kind of like being alone. <laughs> Anyone else feel that way? I, I don't mind being alone. I don't mind a little, a little peace and quiet. Well, Jesus wants to get away from the crowds and pray. Uh, look at verse 23 of Matthew. After he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. So he needs to get alone with his father. He needs to be refreshed by God, his father, through prayer. It's vital. 
It's important. It's necessary. One of the, for those of you who are going to camp this week, one of the negatives about camp in my mind is it's so busy. They just cram your schedule. You're up at, I don't know what time we're up, six o'clock or something like that. What time do we get up? What? Eight? You might be up at eight. I'm not up at eight. All right. You know, the sun comes up and I'm up. Whenever the sun's coming up, that's when I'm up. You could forget about it. Okay. I'm up. You know, in my room at home, I have room darkening shade. So I could be there, you know, I could be at three o'clock in the afternoon. I wouldn't even know. But when you're at camp, you know, when the sun comes up, I don't know how these kids sleep. And then I get in there and I make all types of noise and I get them up or I'll just listen to the Bible and get them up and something. Well, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. But um, it's so busy that you barely have time to get alone with God. And, and so I, I, I really changed my schedule around so that I could get that time, right? And of course, the kids are hearing devotions and all that stuff, but they're not reading the Bible privately, personally. They're not in prayer privately, personally. I see this is so vital. It's so important. It's so necessary. And so Jesus sends his disciples ahead of him to the other side of the sea, and it was uh, approaching nighttime, right? But uh, sailing at the Sea of Galilee at night, it's a risk. It is a risk. These guys are fishermen, though, and so they know all about this. They, they, they catch fish at night, so they understand all this. They understand how to read the skies. Uh, most of the storms, now I'll show you, uh, kind of give you a feel for what's going on here on a map. This is kind of like the northern part of Israel, and it would, it would just keep going down there. But uh, if you zoom in on the Sea of Galilee, it seems, now there's some discussion about this, but it seems that they're at Bethsaida, right? They're, they're here. And, you know, most of the storms would kind of come in from, from the west and from like the northwest over, over where the Mediterranean Sea area would be. And so they'd be fairly easy to see, right? It'd be fairly easy to see them coming. Uh, they could see the clouds developing from some distance, but there's another type of storm that happens on the large lake that is the Sea of Galilee or the Sea of Tiberias, right? Or the Sea of Kinnereth or whatever you want to call it. Um, there's another type of storm that comes and that type of storm is considerably less predictable. Uh, nevertheless, if you look at a map, they're trying to go to the other side of the sea from, and I'll zoom in here, from Bethsaida, to Capernaum from here to here. And if you, as the bird flies, check this out. I think this will work here, yeah. As the bird flies, I don't know if you can see those numbers, that's three and a half, that's three and a, three and a quarter miles from Bethsaida to Capernaum. Let's call it five miles. Let's call it five miles of, five nautical miles, right? Like if you're, whatever, if you're on the sea, let's call it five miles away. So it's not like Jesus is asking them to go some great distance. We're talking about five miles. That's a pretty short distance by boat. So, you know, what can really go wrong in five measly miles, right? On the lake, what can go wrong? Plus, Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who just did this awesome miracle who fed 5,000 men, not including women and children, he told you to get on the boat and go there. I mean, and, and the crowds wanted to make him king, want to crown him the king. If he told us, to, you know, what can really go wrong here? The disciples are on the lake, on the Sea of Galilee. Everything's going well. They're sailing across the small portion of it. Singing songs, maybe, I don't know. Do you know the Muffin Man, the Muffin Man, the Muffin Man? Do you know the Muffin Man who lives on Drury Lane? The other half are like, yes, we know the Muffin Man, right? They're having a grand old time. Maybe they're singing Kumbaya. You know, I don't know. They, I, they wouldn't have those songs. I'm just you know, making light of it. But um, they're just taking a nice, casual little boat ride from one area, one little port to another little port. And everything is going perfectly fine until their worst nightmares come true. 
that other type of storm comes up. Check this out in John 6. Now, when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. And after getting into a boat, they started to cross the sea to Capernaum. It had already become dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea began to be stirred up because a strong wind was blowing. And so those rainstorms I talked about, those thunderstorms that would come from the west, you could see those types of things. You could prepare for those types of things. You could get off the sea. You could get off the lake. This other type of storm comes from the east. It's a whole different type of storm. It's a windstorm. Uh, again, you might remember on the map that they were close to Bethsaida. This is the, the point where they are. And that's right on the edge of the Golan Heights. Now, I kind of thought it might be interesting for you to see a little bit of, you know, what's, what's going on here. This, let's just, you know, there, that's a bad arrow, but they're in here. And the Golan Heights are that, they're, they're, it's that big, what color would you call that? It's like deep yellow, orange-ish. Deep yellow, would you go with deep yellow? I'd go with light yellow and deep yellow. The, 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 what's that? My mustard doesn't look like that. <laughs> I use horse, I use horseradish. I use horseradish. Anyone use horse, horseradish mustard here? I like the deli, the good stuff. I don't use, I don't use the yellow stuff. Anyway, um, let's call it deep, let's call it deep yellow. That's the Golan Heights area. Now, check, check this out. This little section right here is kind of what I want you to focus on. Now, the heights of the Golan Heights, the, the, the tallest point of the Golan Heights, you can't read the number there. It says uh, 4,265. So let's say uh, 4,300 feet high. And the Sea of Galilee is right down here. That's negative 700 feet. So what's the difference between 40? Now, kids, you got to remember, you have a zero in here. Okay, you, you can't forget the zero. So what's the difference between 4,300 feet high and seven uh, above, above sea level and 700 feet below sea level? What's the difference there? A little math lesson for the kids. Anyone? Don't, don't forget, there's a zero in between those numbers. So there's 4,300 feet between you know, the top and zero, and then there's 700 feet between the bottom and zero. So you can't just take 4,300 minus 700. AJ, we're talking about a 5,000 foot drop from the heights of the Golan Heights to basically the bottom of, or to the sea level of the Sea of Galilee. All right, so that's a, that's a, that's a pretty big, here, by the way, here's a few pictures that kind of display that situation. This is taken from the southern tip of the Sea of Galilee, looking east towards the Golan Heights. And you can kind of see those mountain ranges right up, basically right up. There's a, there's a little highway that runs right between the edge of the sea and the mountain. And you're basically, it just basically goes straight up. Now, this picture doesn't quite show it but looking that way, but if you're right on that highway, you're just kind of looking looking up the mountain at certain points. Here's kind of another, another zoomed in picture of what those mountains might look like. So you kind of have uh, some, some pretty serious mountain heights. Actually, this is north looking south, but that kind of gives you a feel for, for what the situation is. You might say, why does this matter? Because cool air comes in from the east and it rushes over here. It kind of, I'll do my best Bill Murray imitation from uh, Groundhog Day. Cool air rushes in from the east and it displaces the warm, moist air that's over the Sea of Galilee. And this whips up sudden, terrible storms over the Sea of Galilee with fierce winds. It wouldn't necessarily be rainstorms, they'd be windstorms. Okay. And these windstorms would come in without warning and they would churn up, right, the water of the Sea of Galilee. And it's really a sailor's worst nightmare. These types of storms cause even modern power boats to stay on land because they're not going to go through that stuff. And you're in a boat that is 
this size. That's not life. That's not life size. That's. <laughs> but that gives you a feel. Not many people can fit in a small fishing boat. All right. So this is a nightmare. Well, anyway, the disciples are out at sea and they're in this tiny fishing boat. And one of these sudden windstorms comes in and whips up, uh, comes in down from the, the Golan Heights and whips up the winds and the waves of the lake. And now they're stuck in this terrible, deadly storm. Matthew says this. In uh, Matthew 14, 24. But the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And this goes on for hours and hours. Matthew says that it goes on into the fourth watch of the night, which is like between three and six in the morning. So they get in when it's about nighttime. It's it's becoming nighttime. And, And they're stuck in a lake only a few miles off only a few miles offshore, stuck in a storm they can't get out of until like three o'clock in the morning, let's say. At the least, three o'clock in the morning. Now, kids, you can do the math on that one too, right? Let's say 9 p.m. Let's say they get, let's say they get into the water around 9 p.m. You already answered, so I'm going to get someone else a chance. And it's now like, let's say three, between three and six. So let's say it's three o'clock. Well, how many hours is that for this little five mile trip? Uh, that's about six hours. And, and what if it's six in the morning? Then it's, it's like nine hours. So they're stuck in this lake in a storm on a trip that should have taken minutes. They're stuck for between six and nine or maybe even more, six or to nine hours. It is a tumultuous, life-threatening storm. A storm that can end their lives. Meanwhile, Jesus is in perfect peace. He's in perfect tranquility with his Father in heaven. Perfect calm. The, 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 the disciples, their, their lives, it's, it's torment right now. Things are going crazy for them. And Jesus is in perfect calm in prayer, perhaps praising his heavenly father, perhaps praying for the people that he had served earlier that day, the people that he had fed, perhaps praying for the disciples who are out at sea. You know, one thing we don't think about a whole lot is, uh, I'm not sure I've ever thought about it until really just this moment. Jesus could have walked on that water hours earlier he could have basically stopped the whole thing from happening. Because remember, there was an earlier incident when he was in the boat with them in Matthew 8, and he calmed, this remember he was sleeping, and, they, and he woke up and he calmed the whole, the whole thing, right? I mean, he could have, he's up there praying. He could have just calmed the whole thing. But he didn't. And his disciples are out there in this tumultuous, seemingly life-threatening storm while Jesus is in perfect peace up on the mountain. They're about four, three, four miles out, just about in the middle of the sea. Things are bad. They're only getting worse. And again, they've been there before. But last time it was with Jesus. And now from their perspective, now if you stop and you look from a divine perspective, God's allowing all this to happen, right? Perhaps making it happen. We don't know. Uh, And the disciples are fearing for their lives, And it kind of goes to show you that sometimes God kind of lets you go through some stuff, you know, before things change. And uh, I I mean, that's not the main point of this message. Don't get me wrong. That's not the, but, but God is allowing these guys to go through some stuff. Why? I can only imagine it's a test of faith. I can only imagine it's to increase their faith. I can only imagine that it's for the sake of their betterment in eternity, right? All things for good for them in eternity, right? That's, that's what I'm imagining. Of course, I don't know anything beyond that. This time, they're out there in the storm, and Jesus isn't there. And so from their perspective, all is lost. 
They're going to, they're, they're, they're probably wondering, are we going to die? And throughout the night, they're at the mercy of the sea, hours and hours of fighting with the power and fury of the waves. And if you've ever gone to the beach and you've ever gone on when there's like some surf and you ever got rocked, anyone ever get rocked by a wave? You feel like you're in a washing machine, right? Anyone ever have that experience where you feel like you're in a washing machine? You ever get slammed down and you think, oh, oh, that one hurt. Right? You ever get, you ever get, what's the thing called, uh, scorpioned? You ever get scorpioned? By, you know, if you're inexperienced, you get scorpioned. If you're experienced, you know, just turn. Just turn, get slammed, wait till the wave goes over, and then get up. Don't, don't fight the whole thing, okay? But if you're inexperienced, you'll get scorpioned. I imagine, I got to imagine Damien Long's been scorpioned a couple of times in his life, right? Am I right about that? Yeah, um, so uh, I, I've been scorpioned a, a couple of times, and it's, it's no fun. That's when your head is, this is your head, it's this way, and your, your body is turned the wrong direction that way, and your feet are like flipping over, over that way. So, so you know, you're, you, if, if you've ever been scorpioned, or if you've ever ridden a wave and it slammed you down, you know, and that's a, what is that, like a five to ten foot wave? It's really not that big of a deal. A five to ten foot wave, the type of force that that has on your body, which is nothing compared to uh, the full power of the sea, right? Well, these guys are fighting. They're fighting the force of this great lake hours and hours, and almost all hope has been lost at this point. I would imagine that absolute terror comes upon some of them as they realize that this could be the end. Now, look, there are moments, like I've had dreams I was going to be in like a plane crash or something like that. Anyone ever have a dream like that? And, and the moment before it happens, in, in my dreams, I'm just like, oh no. But I quickly accept it. Well, this is, this is how it's going to happen, right? And anyone ever feel that way? Like, I just, I, I don't know why I accept it quickly, in my dream, I don't know if I accept it in reality, I suppose I would. The other response is terror, absolute terror, right? Horror. And so I don't know what's going on on this boat, but I imagine that something like that is happening. Maybe some have come to accept this is probably the end. Maybe others are in absolute terror. They're at the mercy of God. Only God could deliver them. Only God could save them. And that sick feeling of impending doom comes upon them. And perhaps for some of them, despair sets in. Now, uh, now is the time to pray scriptures like Psalm 69. Verses 1 through 3. Save me, O God, for the waters have threatened my life. I have sunk deep. I have sunk in deep mire and there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters and a flood overflows me. I am weary with my crying. My throat is parched. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. You ever pray scriptures? You know, like maybe you're not thinking of the exact context of that scripture, but that prayer that someone made or that situation is really applicable to your life at that moment. And you're praying those words, maybe. Uh, In times like these, you see your life flash before your eyes. I imagine, I imagine uh, when death is upon you, you think about your family and you think about your children. If, you know, if only I could see them one more time. If only I could tell them that I love them one last time. Here in John, evening came, disciples went down the sea. After getting in a boat, they started to cross the sea to Capernaum. It had already become dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea began to be stirred up because a strong wind was blowing. Then when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near to the boat. They were frightened. They were frightened. In Matthew 14 and verse 26, check out their response. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. They cried out in horror. It could have been, you know, listen, who knows? It could have been a spirit of a dead person in their mind, in the ancient mind. And I wouldn't think that. If I saw what appeared to be a spirit, I would know it was most likely a demon. Right? They could have thought it was a demon. 
They could have thought it was the angel of death. Whatever the case, this is it. Try to imagine seeing seeing that if you were the disciples, you're off in the distance seeing a, a figure walking towards you after six to nine hours of struggling on the boat. You know, you're probably going to think, oh man, we're in trouble. We're in trouble. Uh, fear, absolute fear. Uh, we can resonate with that fear a little bit when, uh, can resonate with that fear when the doctor says it's cancer, right? Some of you know that fear. Or when your spouse says, it's over, I'm leaving you, right? Like I imagine the first feelings that come in are fear, right? Or when, and this is one I've experienced, when you get the phone call that this person that you love has died, right? And the initial feeling of shock and fear that happens right in your, right in your chest area where your mind initially says, this isn't true, but you know, like at the same moment, this is true, right? Uh, it's, it's like the feeling when you're driving down the highway and you're going a little faster than you should and then you see the cop sitting there and your heart just sinks for a second, right? Anyone ever experienced that? I've never, because I've never sped before. But um, you know that feeling, right? Where like your heart just sinks down like, oh, did I just get caught? You, you look down at your, your speedometer and you're like, whoa, whoa, how, how did I get that fast? I didn't think I was going that fast, right? Um, but when you hear about a lost loved one, it's like that. It's like initially, like there's almost catches your breath, like takes your breath away for a second. You have to catch your breath. Fear, horror. And I imagine that at least some in this boat are feeling fear. They're feeling horror. They're terrified. It is the end. When you see this figure walking, it is the moment perhaps of your death. Death is inevitable. And then he speaks. They had rowed about three to four miles. They saw Jesus walking on the sea. Of course, John's looking back at that. They didn't know he was Jesus at the time, at that moment, and drawing near to the boat. And they were frightened. They were horrified. They were stricken by fear. But he said to them, it is I. Do not be afraid. This is Jesus. This is their Messiah. Now, this is the point where in Matthew's gospel, uh, what I like to do when I, when I study through a passage of scripture, um, I have like this list of things I need to do in, in, in my study process. So one of the first things I like to do is block diagram in English, and then I like the block diagram. I like to look at the Greek, the Greek block diagram, and then I like to, you know, what, I'll go through, I'll look at parallel passages. I like to see did one of the, especially when I deal with Gospels, did one of the other Gospel writers write about this account and what did he say, right? So I like to do that. I think it's fun to compare, how did Matthew speak about this compared to, say, how did John speak about it or whatever else? Um, well, in Matthew's account, this is the moment where Peter gets out. And you, Lord, if it is you, right, that's that moment where they command me to come out and walk, and Peter walks, and then he takes his eye off of Jesus, and he falls, and all that stuff, right? John doesn't say any of that. John doesn't write about that at all. And you say, you know, that's how people preach that passage. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Peter and all about Peter's faith and all about how if he took his eyes off of Jesus, then he sunk in the water, you know, and all that business, right? But that's not even what Matthew was writing about. That wasn't even Matthew's point. Matthew's point was about who Jesus was. It wasn't about Peter's faith. Peter's faith was like a little side point on the whole thing. 
wasn't what the passage was about. Here, John doesn't even bring up Peter walking on water. Now, you might be like, is it because John's jealous that he wish he was the one walking on water? I don't know. You know, I, I don't think so. I, I think what it is is John, it's not important to John's point. It has nothing to do with John's point. Well, anyway, uh, Jesus enters the boat and he calms the storm in verse 21. So they were willing to receive him into the boat and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. Matthew says that in uh, verses uh, 32 and 33 in Matthew's account, when they got into the boat, the wind stopped. And those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, you are certainly the son of God. As soon as Jesus gets into the boat, the storm is over, salvation at last, over six hours, destined to be buried at the bottom of the lake. Now, I don't know if that's exactly how it works. I'm sure bodies will fill up and some, maybe some sink to the bottom, maybe some float to the shore, whatever. I, I don't know everything about that. But six hours of fighting with the storm, waiting to die, and now you have a second chance at life. And when they realize, not only can he feed 5,000 men, plus the women and children, but now can deliver, he can walk on water, which means he has power over creation, over nature itself, over the laws of nature. That's miraculous because God sets in, God sets, you know, buoyancy laws in motion, right? Like I can't just get on water and float on it. You can float in the, the Dead Sea. That's kind of cool. You know, I see a guy out there with a magazine just kind of hanging out with his, with his feet crossed, laying back. And, you know, I have a couple of pictures of myself posing on, on the water. And I, I think I had one kind of like with my, my legs bent back and, you know, I was just kind of goofing around, right? So, so it's like, wow, I'm like floating. This is wild. It just feels weird. How am I floating? But I can't walk even on the Dead Sea. I can't walk on that, right? There are laws of nature that are put in place. Like you feel like you're going to go right under. You, you just go, this is what you do. You go out there. In the, in the Dead Sea, and you're like, okay, all right. And then you just kind of fall back into it. And you're sitting down, and you're like, <laughs> this is so wacky. This is so weird. Mr. Weedy, you swum. Do you, you, you swum? You swam. Have swum. Swim, swimming, swam, have swum. You didn't swim in the, uh, you didn't do it? Yeah. Oh. Carol? Oh, man, you guys missed out. You got to go back. You got to go back. You got to go back and do it. When you go back, let me know. I'd like to, I want to, I want to be a stowaway. I want to, I want to go. Um, there are laws of nature set up that God set up. Who did? Oh, Sergey, you did? Uh, isn't it wild? Right? It's a weird, isn't it a weird feeling? <laughs> well, that's true, too. It was a little disgusting. I, it's slimy. It's, it's kind of like, yeah, it's a little slimy. But it's the, I'm not, I'm, I, to take that part out of it, just the floating aspect is weird, right? It's like you're kind of waiting to go under, but you don't actually go under. You just kind of like sit down, and then your like feet pop up, and you're just like, <laughs> look at this. This is really weird. Um, it takes a little getting used to. It's like being on a float a little bit, except you're kind of, you know, the bottom part of you is kind of in the water a little bit. So it's, it's, it's wild. Um, God sets these laws in place and they can't be broken. He's fed 5,000 people miraculously with food that didn't exist. He's now walked on water, which is impossible. You can't do that. And this is not like one of those one of those uh, visual, uh, when they play tricks on your eyes, right, where the, the water's really skinny or there's something right over the water or there's glass or something and he's walking on it and, you know, people think, oh, look, that guy's walking. No, this is like he's really walking on water. This is miraculous. And now he has calmed the storm. This is impossible. There's only one conclusion, to worship him. At that moment, they realize exactly who Jesus is. And they, in Matthew's account, worship him. They come to a deeper understanding of who Jesus is. He has full authority over nature, over land and sea. He has full authority over creation. And thus, he is worthy of worship. And when you come to the, to the realization of who Jesus really is, it's the only appropriate response. 
It's to worship him. It's to devote your life to serving him. And that's different than being a church person. Church people, they come to church. That's what they do. They come to church. Maybe it's Saturday night, you know, because Sunday's going to be a nice day, so let me go to the Saturday night service. Or maybe uh, maybe it's Sunday morning when it's not raining, you know, because rain is, I, I can't go out and rain. Or maybe you do go out and rain, and you're still just a church person, and it's part of what you do on Sundays, but your life is not committed to discipleship. And there are compromises in your life. There's all types of compromises. There's all types of gods we can put in front of God. We'll talk about those things uh, tonight and maybe next Sunday night a little bit. There's a difference between a genuine believer who is devoting his life to the Lord Jesus Christ and a church person. I would challenge you to figure out which one you are. Anyway, uh, Jesus has... uh, just fed the 5,000. He's dispersed the crowds and he went away. And the next day they want to find him. And we'll just go through these verses real quick because I, I want to deal with them at this passage and not the next one. The next day, the crowd that stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other small boat there except one and that Jesus had not entered with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples had gone away alone. So they were with Jesus over at Bethsaida They saw the disciples go away. They saw Jesus go up into the mountain. They saw no other boats. And they're like, you know, okay, well, where's Jesus? Uh, There came other small boats from Tiberias near to the place where they ate the bread after the Lord had given thanks. And just to kind of show you what's going on, Tiberias would be right right down here. So these boats kind of came up to Bethsaida. And so then they hopped on these boats. And uh, so when the crowd saw... uh, Yeah. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the small boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. Right. And that's where Jesus and his disciples are. When they found him on the other side of the sea, because now they've gone back to to the other side of the sea. They said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? All right. So they find him at Capernaum. They ask how he gets there. And that leads to a lengthy conversation a conversation we can't deal with in one week. A conversation we've got to look at in several weeks, maybe two weeks, three weeks, we'll see. Um, but that kind of leaves us off for what we're going to look at next week. In this passage, the disciples are on the brink of death. Uh, actually, I think this is an appropriate passage to read. And I think Paul brought this up to me when I was going through Matthew 14. Uh, then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and He brought them out of their distresses. He caused the storm to be still so that the waves of the sea were hushed. Only God, only God could do that. Only God could walk on water. Only God could save these disciples from impending doom. And again, the only appropriate response is to worship him. In this passage, Jesus displays his glory. John 1 has declared the glory of Jesus. In John 2, he's displayed his glory. In John 3 and John 4, all up here in John 6, he's displaying his glory. And here, Jesus has all authority over the wind and the seas, over nature, over creation. And so we need to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. We need to worship him. We need to devote our lives to following him. And that's more, again, that's more than being a church person. That's more than being part of Christendom. That's more than reading your Bible every once in a while or praying every once in a while or reading the daily bread or what's the one we have out there? The days of praise. That's more than listening to a couple of Charles Stanley messages on the Facebook. It's real life discipleship and accountability in a local church. We need to devote our lives to serving Jesus Christ who has all authority in heaven and on earth. Uh, If you would take your hymnals and turn to 639, we'll close our service with a hymn. If you're not sure you're saved, you're not sure you have everlasting life, then listen, you come and talk to me. I'll get you lined up with someone who could explain the gospel message to you more clearly uh, so that you can take care of matters today. If you're saved, 
and you're like, you know what? Things have, uh, things have slipped a little bit. And, um, you know, maybe my walk isn't what it once was. And I want to repent today. You can do that. You come in front of everybody if you want. Or you can stay. And people would pray for you. And that's not a bad thing. Or you can stay right at your seat. And you can pray. And nobody will even know except God. And of course, no one will be praying for you, but you have a great mediator between you and the Father, and that is Jesus Christ. You can pray right in your seat while we're singing and settle matters with God. Stand and sing 639.